I'm doing well, Henrik. Uh, thanks for having me on again. Absolutely. I think it's uh, really great to have you back for an update. Uh, 2007, I think, was the last time here we had you on. Quite a bit of uh, time and uh, things have been happening from uh, from that point, obviously. And uh, just to, to give a brief, brief little background here for, for people, I think that most people who are familiar with your work or even a little bit about 2012, uh, your a name your name is connected to the the end date of the Mayan calendar. Obviously, you've been studying the Mayan culture since about 1985, and uh, you have lots of books. I think nine, if not even more, now uh, you know under the banner of 2012 and and the Mayan culture overall. And your latest one here that we're going to talk more about today, obviously, is called the 2012 story: the myths, fallacies, and truth behind the most intriguing date in history. Um, You've obviously seen the subject of 2012 change, uh, John, and evolve, uh, grown huge, and you know, consequently, many misconceptions have arisen because of that. But where do you think we are now? You know, a, a Hollywood, a Hollywood movie later, so to speak. Where are we right now when it comes to 2012, uh, John? Yeah, the Hollywood movie that came out in late 2009 seemed to be a watershed event in which. Uh, the whole misconception of doomsday projected onto 2012 was uh, um, overdone. And uh, so I think in the collective consciousness, um, people are on one level sort of fed up with the doomsday representation of 2012. It just seems to be a sensationalized uh, and, and ultimately misleading and, and fairly superficial perspective on a very profound topic. Um, so there's sort of two things going on. One is that um, people are sort of fed up with anything related to 2012, so the topic is a bit uh, poisoned, you might say, yeah. um, in the collective. But um, you know, we're still we're still we're still a year uh, a year away from the actual 2012 year, and uh, over a year and a half from the the date in December of 2012. So it's my hope that what really should always have been happening, which is an intelligent and honest discussion of what the ancient Maya actually thought about this date, can still happen in the collective uh, discussion of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you've been uh, going at it uh, a little bit with some of the academics out there as well. Uh, and some of this, I understand, you cover in your book as well, obviously. Uh, and, 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 you know, credence to you for even having the energy to, to do all that. But ha what's your... What's your um, purpose with that in, in one sense? Do you feel that you've been ab able to actually reach somebody in terms of the work that you've been doing and, and uh, when it comes to studying the Maya, or has it all just been a waste of, of time, John, trying to reach some of these people who have been criticizing you and others who are doing this kind of work? Well, what I've been engaged in is a big project, really, and uh, it's introducing a fairly revolutionary idea into how we understand the ancient Maya, how sophisticated they were in terms of not only their astronomical science, which has been sort of the focus of my reconstruction with 2012, but also in their profound spiritual teachings. And I've always seen an integration of these two perspectives, uh, profound uh, spiritual teachings, metaphysics of human consciousness and awakening, as well as a good old-fashioned nuts and bolts reconstruction of ancient Maya cosmology and how it relates to this 2012 date. Uh, so it has been a difficult path, a different, difficult process in terms of making inroads into status quo academia. I'd say that in the last three years there's been a great deal of progress, and there are some allies that I have now in, in academia, uh, very progressive uh, scholars, and there's been a great deal of attention to 2012 now because we have the 2012 date on an inscription a hieroglyphic inscription uh, from the site of Tortuguero, classic period Maya site, which really only came into public, uh, you know, widespread awareness uh, in 2006. So it's a fairly recent thing, and, and the inscription has been examined now. And uh, what I've done with this is that there's uh, 13 dates, and there's astronomy related to those 13 dates. So that's exactly where the progress and the revolution is taking place because we're able to identify astronomy in relation to the 2012 date, as I always uh, suspected, you know, putting mm -hmm. my theory on the table 15 years ago and 
it uh, there's a lot of uh, breakthroughs happening now in uh, academia. Well, that's excellent. I look forward to uh, talking about some of some of this as well. Uh, but I don't know if you've. I mean, I don't think you've directly made any kind of predictions, if you will, when it comes to 2012. But one thing I always like to ask people when the, when they return to the program and, and we've been talking about 2012 in in the past is have things unfolded so far as you've kind of expected them to to do you know a couple of years ago or three four or might maybe even five years ago have your perception overall of the end date changed as as we coming closer to it now uh, John I've been a bit surprised uh, I think 20 years ago when I first got into this investigation I was uh, a bit naive in thinking that with good research and good documentation that the uh, reconstruction of ancient Maya astronomy would just proceed uh, sort of without a hitch. But I've been somewhat surprised that there's so many uh, politics involved in academia with uh, very strong egos and um, the fact that I'm operating outside of academia as an independent researcher has made the process a bit more difficult than I had imagined. So as far as uh, the whole idea of prophecy with connected with 2012, um, I've been open to languaging that from a, a slightly unusual perspective. I don't believe that prophecies for 2012 have to do with the prediction of earthquakes or hurricanes or specific sort of Nostradamus-like visions or something like that. Right. I I think that there's a general understanding that the ancient Maya had about the nature of time and the nature of cycles. The Maya drew their understanding of time from nature. And in nature, time moves in cycles, and you always have a period of increase and a period of decrease. Uh, you know, the moon waxes to fullness, and then it wanes to the new moon, and the year goes through a similar process from summer to winter. And what I've been able to identify is that in the Maya creation mythology, there is what you might call a prophecy for 2012, but it has to do with the general understanding of cycle dynamics and how these things play themselves out in the realm of collective human consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we can get into this a bit later if you want. It, it, it's something that I've written about for many years now. It has to do with the rise of a kind of limited controlling uh, self-serving ego consciousness, which eclipses our connection with the transcendent higher wisdom. And so that's one pole, that's one extreme part of the cycle of time that we're in. And then the other is when the ego is put back into right relationship with the higher divine uh, self or, or truth or wisdom. And that's when we have an open relationship with the big picture the the whole perspective on what it is to be human on this planet and that's what you might call uh, the other side of the the process so what I've seen in the prophecy is that it does seem to be coming true in that our world is being ruled and ruined by uh, self-serving limited ego consciousness especially as it plays itself out in the corporate structures the mm -hmm. corporations that are uh, just operating from a short-term uh, uh, profit motive and destroying environments in third-world countries in the process. And uh, that's, uh, that's, that's only one part of it, though. The other part is that we you know, are engaged in a process of transformation and uh, opening up to, uh, to a higher perspective on things. Right. So from that point of view, uh, this this latter aspect that you mentioned, you you you've kind of seen, you can see and witness that this actually is happening in the world and, and unfolding, um, considering where things are, are are heading when it comes to our maybe economic situation around the world and also as you say how the the corporate uh, you know establishment what path they have taken so to speak, right, John? Yeah, the Maya prophecy operates on the realm of the archetypes, the deep essential uh, roots of human consciousness and how they manifest into the world and I think the Maya had an insight into these kinds of cycle dynamics and what typically tends to manifest at the end of a cycle the Maya I think were tuned into um, sort of an empirical 
uh, nature of the cycles that we're in. This has to do with the astronomy uh, connected to 2012 and the astronomical alignment that culminates in the years around 2012. So their prophecy also is not just sort of a vision or something or, or an assertion or something like that. I think it's a deep understanding of the nature of cycles and how human consciousness vacillates between extremes. You know, there's periods of forgetting, forgetting our connection to our higher selves, and then reawakening to have a full connection with our higher selves. And, uh, and these things are connected to empirical, astronomical uh, cycles in mm-hmm. nature. Mm-hmm. Do, now, do you see that um, whoever the forces are, if we look at it from that point of view, that have kind of hijacked 2012 then in that sense they've they've taken uh more focus on on the on the doomsday uh theory surrounding two, 2012 have they sufficiently managed to take the focus away from from the the spiritual aspects and and the archetypal aspects that you mentioned john and and, and instead managed to get the majority of people to just look at the the doomsday scenario that uh, that many people are, are, oh, are yeah. focused on yeah yeah, Henrik, I'm glad you opened it up in that direction. That's a really uh that's a really amazing perspective to have on this because that's really what's going on with the 2012 topic. Um and and this is something that we could sort of expect and make a prediction about. If we want to say anything about what's going to be happening in 2012, it's precisely as you say that the forces of limitation as it manifests in the mainstream media and those entities in society and civilizations that want to keep people limited and stuck so that they can be controlled, those forces are going to be working overtime to mitigate the transformative potential that 2012 really does have. So that's what we should be on the lookout for. Um, and it's it's basically <laughs> it's all the deceptive uh, misinformation that is currently flooding the marketplace in regards to 2012 with you know, fear-based scenarios of doomsday and, and this kind of thing. I mean, um, that that really is what we, we can sort of expect. But I believe that thinking intelligent people who can see beyond the veil of appearances um, can just uh, see through all of that because that's just the bait. That's what the forces of limitation are, are hanging out as bait, you yeah. know, to, to keep us stuck. You know, if we sure. want to bite into that, then we're going to be uh, sort of hanging ourselves in a sense. We're going to be taking the bait and uh, not really seeing the deeper processes at work here mm-hmm. that we really need to engage. We need to consciously engage these deeper processes in order to bring it through to the to the next level. Now, the question is... Uh... Are these things being processed, no matter if you're aware of them or not? Meaning that even the, uh, for for most people, um, this is a, this is an unconscious process that we are all going through right now, uh, humanity at large, for for various reasons, as astronomical, and and there is seems to be the in the quality of times right now where a lot of the uh, the, the darker aspects, the, the the shadow complex, as some people would term it. Is kind of coming to the surface, no matter if you want, no, no matter if you want to, uh, having that happen to you or not, in one sense. And to me, it seems like the world, if we kind of generalize and look at the world um, as as an entity right now in its in itself, it is kind of going through that right now. As far as I'm seeing, it's kind of the dark night of the soul for for the planet in one way. Uh, I don't know what, what's your what's your perspective on that, John? Would you agree with that or not? Uh, I think yeah, I would agree with that. It's um, it gets into some pretty deep uh, philosophical uh, truths and conversation about um, you know I, I think that it's kind of like life itself. We will get out of life um, exactly how much we put into it and how much we consciously engage with it. And uh, I think there's a spectrum of um, tendencies in people. Um, some people just sort of like you know, plug into the systems and, and go through life and enjoy life or whatever and, and have uh, and, and are, are sort of unconsciously just going about the paths that are laid out for them by others. And especially at a time of crisis and transition as we have going on in the world today now, I think that there is a certain requirement or, or um, 
there's a necessity for people to engage the process of transformation. I don't expect that every single person on the planet will choose to do that. Sure. There might be a, a, a small but big enough uh, percentage of people that engage that that transformation and then um, hopefully a better and sustainable uh, future uh, can result from that that everybody will benefit from even if they hadn't been fully engaged in the uh, in the fight, you might say. Absolutely. And uh, what what would you say, still though, do you feel is the main the main focus and, and the most important aspect and, and points in, in your research and, and work, John? I'm, I'm uh, mentioning this from the concept of uh, uh, you know your previous work on the galactic alignment, and then obviously in your new new book as well. In uh, specifically in chapter seven, you do have a, an an update on, on the galactic. Alignment. Maybe you can just run some of that uh, through for us in case we have some listeners with us who are not familiar with that aspect of your work sure. uh, yet, John. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that because this is really close to my heart and it's <clears throat> it's been a work that uh, I seem to have been called to do and uh, goes back to my early travels living and working among the Maya in the 1980s and being inspired by Maya culture and the friends I was making and Originally, I was kind of engaged in a in, in awareness of the political uh, activities that were going on down there in Guatemala in the 1980s, where there were uh, death squads and over 200,000 Maya people disappeared, and villages were wiped off the face of the map. And so I was much more engaged in the uh, in the political uh, difficulties that were going on, and I wrote articles about that. Um, I soon became more involved and interested in the uh, the uh, Maya calendar and the spiritual teachings, and the 2012 date popped up for me pretty early on as a mystery. Um, why did the Maya pick this date? And um, I began investigating and asking the right questions, and um, in the mid-90s, I found what I felt to be the key and uh, it has to do with a rare astronomical alignment called the galactic alignment or the uh, uh, solstice galaxy alignment. There's various ways to uh, define it. Um, it's basically the alignment of the December solstice sun with the bright band of the Milky Way. Uh, so that's why it's a galactic alignment. Hmm. Um, we can go maybe more into detail into that later, but the point is that... <clears throat> In the mid-90s, I did uh, fully engage uh, kind of an interdisciplinary synthesis of looking at Maya traditions, including the creation myth and the ball game. And especially, I investigated the early Maya archaeological site called Ithapa. Ithapa is a pre-classic site. It was thriving about 2,000 years ago. It's in southern Mexico, right by the Guatemala border. And Maya scholars concur uh, that the long count calendar and the Maya calendar systems were probably formulated within the context of this Isapa culture that preceded the Maya. And the site of Isapa I found to be very, very um, illuminating because there's carved monuments uh, depicting aspects of the Maya creation myth with the hero twins and so on. Mm. And there's also astronomical alignments there. So my 2012 alignment theory was presented in my book, Maya Cosmogenesis 2012, which came out in 1998. And that really uh, broke the case. And uh, the process over the last 13 years has been one of trying to engage professional Maya scholars in um, a discussion around this evidence that I found for this uh, reconstruction of, of why the Maya picked this date in 2012 to end the great cycle of 13 Baktuns. In the long count calendar, the period of 13 Baktuns, about 5,125 years, is the period in the long count calendar that, that comes to completion on December 21st of 2012. So those are, those are just the facts, the basic sort of facts uh, that one needs to begin one's investigation with. But it's always been a mystery as to why this date fell on a solstice. I mean, that was interesting to me pretty early on. Mm. And uh, so um, everything kind of unfolded from there. 
Now, of course, as you mentioned earlier, I've had a great deal of difficulty in uh, engaging Maya scholars in rational conversations about the evidence that I found for this uh, interpretation or reconstruction that I've offered. Yeah. Now, with the Tortuguero Monument in 2006, this is really the main subject of that Chapter 7 in my new book, The 2012 Story. It's, it's sort of an update on the galactic alignment theory because the evidence of the astronomy connected to the 13 dates on that monument from Tortuguero that monument from Tortuguero has the 2012 date on it, and so there's been a lot of attention to it. Um, but nobody was really looking at the uh, astronomy until just about over two years ago, I began a conversation with a progressive Maya scholar named Michael Grofe. Mm. Brilliant, brilliant scholar, and uh, very well versed in the epigraphic translation process with the hieroglyphs, and also very, very well-versed in astronomy, which is a rare thing to have both of those things going on. And that's why Michael was able to um, uh, identify some things in the monument. And uh, so I really credit him for the first identification of some of these astronomical patterns in the monument. And then working together, we sort of worked it all out about two years ago and that's what uh, that's what I go into in Chapter 7 with the updates. And the bottom line is basically that the evidence on Tortuguero Monument 6 um, verifies the uh, galactic alignment thesis in a, in a very, very compelling way. Hmm. That is very interesting. And um, connected with this, this monument or, or the hieroglyphics attached to this, then, is, is there anything um, else beyond the fact that this date comes up that is mentioned in terms of... Uh, uh, why why this is important, or, or is there any other kind of information that you can share with us about that? Oh, yeah, it's very exciting. Um, there's uh, not only the information that one can easily sort of plug into the computer to look at the astronomy connected to the 13 dates on the monument, but there's an, a whole inscription that relates to the 7th century Maya king named uh, Balam Ahau, or Lord Jaguar. Lord Jaguar is really the protagonist of the entire monument. The entire monument is sort of like a biographical uh, testimony to his life as king and the various things that he did. So every single event on there is somehow directly related to his, uh, his person. You know, his, uh, he has a personal relationship with all the different things. So the fact that the uh, monument ends with the 2012 date and then a description of what is supposed to happen in 2012 uh, makes us suspect that it somehow had a personal meaning for him. And sure enough, it did, because the main thing with the monument is that uh, he was born on a day in 612 AD when the sun was lined up with the Milky Way. It wasn't a solstice. It was 20 days before the solstice because the astronomy of the precession of the equinoxes is what brings the solstice and the position of the sun together to align with the Milky Way. And that happens only in the era of 2012. Hmm. That's what makes the 2012 date so unique. But nevertheless, you have this analogy, this visual analogy that one can uh, see between the astronomy of his birthday and the astronomy of 2012. And that's why I believe uh, he made this connection and sort of claimed 2012 as his uh, personal uh, sort of totem, in a sense. And so to answer your question, we could get into a little bit about what the inscription says is supposed to happen. Um, and, you know, uh, it, there there is some really good progressive work that's been done on that by German uh, scholar Sven Gronmeier mm -hmm. and uh, American epigrapher and Maya scholar uh, Barbara McLeod that came out just last August. So that's pretty exciting stuff too, and it connects into what Lord Jaguar was intending to do uh, and intending the 2012 date to mean. Interesting. So uh, would you like to talk a little bit more about that then? Because I've heard uh, about uh, Barbara McLeod 
a little bit before as well and coming up in the context of this and i'm i'm, uh, I'm sure uh, our listeners also are, are interested to hear a little bit more about this and what it actually because this is um as far as i know then uh, uh, john the the 2012 date has not been directly associated with with a seller or, or an inscription like this before this has m- mostly primarily been the interpretation of, of the calendar and, and doing the the math so to speak on some of the inscriptions right but here is directly now then a um yeah a, a, a hint about 2012 so to speak yeah well exactly there's uh, and, it, and it helps us understand how the ancient maya were thinking about 2012 i should say before we get into that a little bit that um yeah it's true that there was not a widespread awareness of the Tortuguero monument before 2006. Uh, some specialist scholars knew about it, but uh, they weren't very forthcoming about the fact of it uh, existing, hmm. which is interesting to contemplate all by itself, because I've right. been talking to scholars about this for many years, and for many years scholars were saying, oh yeah, well we don't have an actual 2012 date in any of the inscriptions that we find. And these would be classic period inscriptions. The writing system was developed and really starts being seen um, after about uh, 200 AD. Um, And that's when the classic period Maya really got going. And uh, so the thing about my work, going back to the early 90s, I didn't have access to, or I didn't, I wasn't aware of the Tortuguero monument. So what I did in order to understand 2012 is that I looked at the iconography, the symbol system, the pictographic symbol system that you could see on the monuments of Isapa. This seemed like a reasonable way to get to some kind of understanding of what the the creators of the long count calendar thought about 2012. So I didn't have the uh, benefit of working with actual inscriptions. I was working with iconography, which is sort of precedes the development of the writing systems. Mm -hmm. And I believe that those iconographic uh, carvings are statements. A lot of modern Maya scholars uh, disallow that perspective, but I think that they're very important statements all by themselves. And there's astronomical alignments of the site at Asapa and uh, what I basically did is piece together a perspective that showed evidence, a combination of astronomy and the iconography and the archaeological setting of the site, basically like archaeoastronomy or astrotheology, you might call it, and uh, the carved monuments were really a critical key for that. So I did come up with a perspective on how they thought about 2012, which is now being confirmed by the 2012 date inscription from Tortuguero. But yeah, for many years the scholars said, uh, you know, we don't have a 2012 date. Now we do. And uh, those specialist scholars who can decipher the inscriptions, they're called epigraphers, like Barb McLeod and Sven Gronmeyer and Michael Grove and Eric Boot and, and many others. Uh, there's been attention to the full inscription. And uh, it's, it's quite a lengthy, detailed inscription on this Tortuguero Monument 6. And uh, so it was just last August that Sven Gronmeyer, who was the archaeologist who studied the site of Tortuguero and published his dissertation on it, oh, probably about six or seven years ago, hmm. um, and Barbara McLeod, who's a very uh, amazing, insightful um, epigrapher, my scholar. And so, um, now, the thing about this is that uh, they did not look at the astronomy of the 13 dates. So that's a piece of the puzzle that's been missing. Uh, They did come up with a clearer interpretation of the text directly related to what happens in 2012. Because a couple of the glyphs were kind of eroded. Right, right. And, and, and so initially scholars were like, oh, well, you know, we have this 2012 date, but the verb glyph, you know, what <laughs> it's saying is supposed to happen is eroded, so we can't be exactly sure. But yeah. they actually went back to some of the early photographs, and they found better evidence, and so they're, they're pretty sure as to what, um, uh, what is supposed to happen. It involves a ritual or a ceremony, 
involving a deity named Bolon Yokte Ku. And uh, if you want to get into that right now, we can we can get into that a little bit. Sure, that would be interesting. Go ahead, uh, John. Okay, well, um, at the end of this Tortuguero Monument 6, you find the 2012 date, and then it says what is supposed to happen on that date. And it, it involves a ceremonial rite in which there will be a witnessing or a seeing of Bolon Yokte Ku, who is a supernatural deity. So the implication is that he will be invoked to be present for a ceremony, and then he there will be a wrapping. The, the verb or the, um, yeah, that's the verb that they were trying to figure out. He will be wrapped, which has a variety of meanings, including he will don a costume, and Barb McLeod thinks that it means he will be um, uh, adorned for the ceremony. And uh, this is pretty typical of Maya ceremonies in which they take a totem icon that represents a supernatural deity and they dress it. They put a costume on it. It's a, it's a sort of a reverential treatment for the preparation of the ceremony. Now, Bolon Yokteku is a deity that you find in other contexts. In, in the other inscriptions, and he's always involved in uh, period-ending ceremonies. So that makes sense, because this is happening on the great period ending in 2012. Mm. Um, and uh, what, what the preparation is for, the costume, uh, the costuming and the wrapping, actually has another connotation in which um, there's a bundling that happens and the Maya talk about the bundling of time, the wrapping up of the bundle of time at the end of the cycle. And the deity connected to this, basically what's going on is there's a preparation that the deity is going to be sacrificed. Hmm. There's going to, the ceremony involves deity sacrifice. And here's the critical thing that's really interesting here. Lord Jaguar, the 7th century Maya king who is the protagonist of the entire monument, um, he is by implication involved in this ceremony. So although it's some 1,350 years after he's died, the implication, and this is where it's really, really fascinating, the implication is that he is to be present also mm -hmm. for this ceremony. How can that possibly happen? He's dead. Well, the thing is that in the Maya tradition, Maya kings often invoke departed ancestors, departed kings. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's a very common thing to see in the inscriptions uh, a Maya king invoking uh, his great-great-grandfather, an earlier king, right. to be present for and sometimes symbolically or supernaturally participate in a ceremony that's happening in, in real time, in contemporary time. I believe, and uh, Gronmeyer and McLeod didn't take it to this level, but I believe that Lord Jaguar has prepared himself to be invoked in 2012 so that he can be present to perform the sacrifice of Bolon Yokte. Hmm. Because every sacrifice requires a sacrificial priest. And you see this, this dynamic. There's the sacrificer and there's the sacrificed. And they operate sort of together. So the sacrificial priest is really the, um, uh, the person who facilitates the rebirth of the world by sacrificing the deity of the previous cycle. And Lord Jaguar believed that he would have this uh, special role to play in 2012 and that he would then... Um, you know, have a great status. You know, it really increased his status. Uh, in, in some respects, the Tortuguero Monument Six is a kind of uh, propaganda. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a rhetorical uh, statement that he's making that he is going to be the one who can usher in the new world age um, hmm. at the 2012 sacrifice of Bol on Yokte. <laughs> so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, so, I, I think, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. do, so do you think then that, um, uh, are we talking about a, a, a kind of a ritual here that, that might be, um, you know, it might be played out if, if we look at it from that point of view, from, from 
um, any of the, the local Maya? Or are you aware, if they are aware of any of this, is this remembered or is this just still, the, this is just fragments on stones that is just now being rediscovered and, and no one else knows about this? Uh, what, do you, what do you make of this, uh, John? Yeah, this uh, interpretation that I've just given uh, is is built upon the decipherment of the inscription that was offered only six months ago okay, by it. Gronmeyer. And so it's, it's a very new thing, plus it's my own sort of add-on to it, uh, taking it a little bit further. And um, to answer your question, I think that it's, it's a very exciting for a couple of reasons. Um, one might suspect that Lord Jaguar was probably expecting, or maybe it didn't really matter in terms of the propaganda that was being put out there. It made him look good anyway. But uh, he would, he might have expected that some of his descendants would still be around in 2012, right. and that they would be around to invoke him to do the amazing magical act that he was preparing himself for, or presented himself as being able to accomplish. Mm. Uh, so there is this kind of funny science fiction scenario in which you can imagine modern Maya ceremonialists, if they understood this inscription in this way, that they might uh, attempt the ceremonial invocation of Lord Jaguar. Uh, that's kind of a funny scenario. I believe that it has meaning in the sense, if we go to the kind of archetypal level with this, what does this mean symbolically? How how do these symbolic things play our play out in the potential that 2012 has for our own awakening and movement into an, a new era? So it's basically just reaffirming the perspective on the Maya creation mythology that I've offered uh, for a long time now. It has to do with the possibility that each one of us has to be the sacrificial priest that can sacrifice the uh, self-serving egoism that lies within all of us and keeps us stuck to a place of limitation in our spiritual awakening. This is basically that dynamic I mentioned that you find in the Maya creation myth between the seven macaw deities. Right, yeah. He's, he's the archetype of vain megalomaniacal egoism, and he tries to keep humanity stuck by controlling them and deceiving them with fear and so on. Well, this archetype of, of uh, blind egoism exists in all of us to various degrees, and it's what keeps us from awakening and opening up to uh, a higher perspective, uh, a renewed perspective, having a renewed connection with the big picture, the unity consciousness, and, and sort of reconnecting ourselves to that that higher wisdom, that transcendent uh, wisdom. And so I, I kind of can make an, uh, a symbolic sort of interpretation of what this 2012 ceremonial ritual might mean for each one of us and how we can maybe be engaged in a process of, of facilitating that sacrifice of the illusions that keep us stuck right. to a plane of limitation. So so again, we're, we're not talking about literal... Uh, sacrifice, but to metaphorical, symbolical sacrifice in that sense? Well, I think so. I think one result of this, if we can sever the ties to the this illusion, what I call the seven macaw system, um, if we sever the ties and we stop feeding that as it, as it exists inside of each one of us, then there can be a kind of a, a fall or a downfall or a, a literal sacrifice uh, of something real in the world, and it's the real system that we find in the world that is basically how the uh, uh, the seven macaw system operates in huge corporations and uh, corrupt governments and uh, things like this. In fact, we've we've seen in recent uh, weeks uh, the events in uh, Cairo and the Middle East in which we do seem to have a literal sort of uh, playing out of the sacrifice of and people are are willing now to sacrifice their their connection to and obedience to systems which do not support um, um, you, you know a better 
uh, uh, way of life and, and being more fully human on the planet. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, um, because one of the questions that, that comes up here, obviously, is how one interpretation of all of this can be that they're talking about something that is on a global scale. They're talking about the whole Earth, the whole planet, what, what everybody is going through in one sense. And the other side of this is that this is more about their own tradition, a, a local tradition. This is the Maya describing something that is happening in, in their own culture, so to speak. Is there anything in, in their mythology or stories that, that seems to suggest that this is about... This is about the whole planet and, and what everyone on it is going to go through. Um, is there anything hinting towards that, uh, John? Well, that's a good question. I, I think that um, the ancient Maya would have perceived um, sort of a, um, a link-up between the microcosm and the macrocosm on some level. Mm -hmm. They 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 didn't have like a global concept of the Earth being a sphere and there being you know, other cultures on the other side of the globe or anything like that. But I think they understood that there is this connection between the microcosm and the macrocosm. And and in their shamanistic cosmology, of course, they saw the three main domains or levels of the universe from the underworld uh, to the human world to the upper world, the realm of the supernaturals. This would be sort of like their understanding that there is this bigger picture on which these things are going to be playing themselves out. And world renewal is a concept in Mesoamerican thought. And, you know, by world renewal, I think that's their understanding that these things play themselves out on the biggest level imaginable. And here we are as we approach 2012 and we have this global civilization going on so it's reasonable to, to suspect that that would that perspective would apply to um world renewal on a on a global scale mm -hmm. yeah ab absolutely and uh, so again uh, it is a kind of a battle between these uh, forces as well that you mentioned though i mean obviously the whole uh, maya creation story is is involved in the the maya hero twins and and in that story, the 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 seven macaw uh, deity com, comes into it as well, of course. Um, and, and so, do you think that uh, what we're seeing in terms of the the world, uh, you know, the corporate world structure that is emerging, is kind of representative of one of these forces, while we have a a, a people, so to speak, a regular people st representing another force, which is trying to break free from uh, from this uh, the corporate structure, so to speak, uh, John. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it seems sort of simplistically dualistic, but I think that this is often how things play themselves out, especially in uh, the dynamics that tend to emerge at the end of a cycle. Things get really polarized. Yeah. You know, things uh, things get really polarized, and um, <clears throat> it's a it's it's very much a crisis and a challenge that we have going on in the world today, and it certainly is pretty interesting that these things are playing themselves out on a global scale in a very, very intense way uh, in the modern world, in modern times, precisely when we are approaching this uh, this 2012 date in the ancient Maya calendar. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, we have also had a lot of interesting things happening when it comes to both our climate, obviously, but also in terms of earthquakes and, and, and weird, strange effects, if we can term it that, uh, that have unfolded in, into this new year. And of course, a question that goes along with this is, is, is this because of any of the effects uh, that the galactic alignment is having on the Earth? Because, I mean, again, as you pointed out in many other interviews and, and in the presentations you've done, uh, the galactic alignment happens over a very, very long period of time. Uh, and there is a point when, when it's um, at the dead center, so to speak, which is around 2012. But even many years after, it's still going to be fairly close to galactic center. Isn't that right, John? And, and again, if so, yeah. what kind of effects are we talking about here on, on, on the planet? Yeah, yeah, this is a, this is a great uh, uh, new direction to sort of consider here in our interview. And it's, it's really a, an amazing thing to think about. And uh, does the galactic alignment have any kind of real empirical effects that uh, modern science might be able to measure, perhaps? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. It's an interesting question. Um, it's something that I took up in my follow-up my follow book, 
uh, the, the book that I wrote after Maya Cosmogenesis 2012, which came out in 1998, I then asked that question. I'm like, wow, well, you know, is there any evidence that any other ancient civilizations were tuned into this galactic alignment process? I mean, certainly many of them were aware of this procession of the equinoxes. Uh, you can go back to ancient Egypt and even ancient Vedic India and look at the doctrine of the uh, yugas, the world ages with the yugas, and find interesting information there yeah. about their awareness of procession and so on. So on one level, it seems to be uh, something that, you know, all of, well, not all, but many of the ancient civilizations were tuned into as being a, a profound and in, informing sort of process that the earth undergoes it's changing relationship to the larger galactic picture over basically a 26,000 year period with procession and how that uh, in the ancient philosophies how that uh, defines humanity going through um, changes and uh, now the question as to whether there are measurable empirical effects um, I'm not sure I don't know this is a bit beyond uh, my abilities. Um, I believe that uh, physicists uh, should look at this. Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, in my book, Galactic Alignment, I pointed to the theories of a uh, uh, social philosopher named Dr. Oliver Reiser, who was a professor at the University of Pittsburgh for some 50 years in uh, Philadelphia. And in fact, he worked with Albert Einstein on, on languaging his theories for the popular press and so on. Mm -hmm. But Oliver Reiser was an interesting character, and, and he did um, believe that our changing orientation to the galactic center over uh, many thousands and thousands of years probably would have something to do with um, changing things on Earth. Uh, one can only theorize. It's hard to say. Um, Maybe there's some kind of angular scalar waves that affect uh, things. One of the tricky things in this is that the galactic alignment really is uh, something that is only applicable to Earth. The Earth, from the vantage point of Earth, um, is experiencing the galactic alignment um, because it's from the vantage point of the Earth that the solstice sun lines up with uh, the center of the Milky Way galaxy on the Milky Way. Mm. Um, so there's some tricky things in this, and it's it's definitely by no means clear or certain whether empirical effects can be demonstrated with this. Um, I like to you know point out that whether or not we can prove that the galactic alignment has real empirical effects, uh, what I try to do in my work is to simply show that the galactic alignment idea or image is the thing that the Maya were utilizing when they created their long count calendar and it's and it's the reason why they uh they picked this date to end this great cycle in their calendar mm, i see and um i mean the again there's so many variables uh obviously that we're that we have in the universe forces of energies we are talking about massive changes in depending on where where, where the sun is currently in, in its cycle and if we have solar flares happening and so forth as well but people are now even beginning to consider magnetic reversal. Even the British Geological Survey is beginning to looking at this as a possible scenario. And and again, we, we have the situation where we have a lot of uh, uh, strange effects. Uh, you know, magnetic North Pole is moving towards Russia about 40 miles per year now, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's like the question is if we have a, a kind of a domino effect, if you will, happening here and a possible consequence, a possible variable on top of all of this might be this, the, the alignment happening as well uh, at the same time here, uh, John? These are all interesting questions, yeah. And it's, it's not exactly the focus of my work, but I, I feel like they're worthwhile pursuing. I mean, certainly, uh, when I was born in the early 60s, there were 3 billion people on the planet. Now there are close to 7 billion people on the planet. Yeah. And with all the environmental degradation of the Amazon rainforest and the depletion of species and, and uh, all this stuff that's going on right now in this sort of alignment window, I, I like to think about sort of a 36-year minimum for the galactic alignment if you define it in a very sort of precise way. 
uh, this this alignment window that we're in. It certainly seems a mighty strange coincidence that all these things are are going on right now as we approach 2012. Absolutely. Uh, John, a little bit later here in our, in our next hour, I want to definitely talk more about some of the misconceptions about 2012. I think this is one of the, the, the interesting aspects to your latest book as well and, and, and talk about some of the many the many ideas that are floating around out there and, and what your stance is on this and so forth as well. But there's another point I wanted to uh, run by you here before we take a little break and, and talk more about your uh, websites and so forth. And that has to do with... Um, the Naval Observatory, uh, I don't know how much credence you put to the fact that they had tracked the uh, calculations here to the winter solstice happened precisely at 11.11 on the uh, the 21st of December 2012. But then about a year ago, allegedly, they, they actually changed that. And the calculation is now to happen around 11.12, I think. Uh, m- minor point, perhaps, if one isn't an observer of eleven eleven and, and uh, that whole you know phenomena, if you will, in that sense. But did you hear about this? And if so, has it any significance at all as you see it? Oh yeah, I I, I think that's interesting. I'd actually looked into the data on that. I don't know, probably about twelve, thirteen years ago, because the U.S. Naval Observatory does have the very precise calculations. Um, however, I think that you know, of course, that's based on the prime meridian. Um, that uh, runs through Greenwich, and so the timing of that would be a function of that placement of the zero point on the grid of the Earth. Um, I've always actually, I thought that the the charts originally said that the exact solstice minute would be 11.13 a.m. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, GMT time, and so there's a lot of people, uh, maybe there was conflicting calculations, I wouldn't be surprised. It seems like to be able to nail that down to the precise minute would be a bit uh, a bit unwarranted, um, <laughs> That's right. given That's right. that there's, you know, I guess if you if you stand 10 feet over here, it's 11-11, but if you're standing, you know, 20 yards over this way, it's 11-13 or something right, like that. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a bit strange, but the people who like the 11-11 mystical number uh i think sort of picked up on that sure, and it, it is sure. one of those bizarre strange numer- numerological things exactly it's it's there anyway and uh, we I, I put up an article about it i can link it up for people and they can go and check it out for themselves on the uh, the naval observatory website there it's a it's an interesting fact if there's anything symbolic i, I don't know about that but uh in, in regard uh, john let's talk a little bit about your your websites and things like that as well here uh that we want to give out your uh, your main main website I would say is alignment twenty twelve dot com. Then obviously you do have John Major Jenkins dot com as well. And also for more specifically more information about your latest book, uh, people simply can go to the twenty twelve the two one uh, two zero one two story the twenty twelve story dot com uh, as well. Uh, can people pick up uh, uh, copies from from uh, from that that website, John? And and uh, is there anything else you want to mention in terms of your websites or or the work you have uh, out there? Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I've sort of retracted from directly offering my books on my websites, although I think there's still an order page up for some of the books. Um, it's uh, uh, the one thing that I do offer on alignment2012.com is a three CD audio program called Unlocking the Secrets of 2012. So it's a good three and a half hours of audio, which goes into all the work and the theories and so on. And I, I offer that as a special offer with a, a free DVD um, from one of my presentations. So that's, that's one thing that I'm sort of, uh, you know, saying that's a good place to go to get the information. Um, I think people should just go to the, their local bookstores, you know, and, and order it through there, you know, and or or you could go online. Of course, the online places um, have all the books; uh, they're still in print. Um, and the websites have evolved a little bit. Um, in recent years, I have set up a book page for the 2012 story, and. Uh, I think all of the websites are sort of mutually linked together. The the recent one is kind of a WordPress page that I put up, johnmajorjenkins.com, and I've been putting a certain amount of time into that one. I've got different uh, posts on there now. The whole thing with uh, 
the paper that I wrote for the Society for American Archaeology that I presented yeah. last April right. is up there is on a link. And so people want to get the download on that paper with the astronomy of Tortuguero and the whole debate with scholars around that that happened just a couple of months ago. It's uh, turned into a PDF file and can be uh, um, accessed uh, through that johnmajorjenkins.com website. All right, uh, excellent. Uh, we will have the links up on our website, of course, as well. But uh, johnmajorjenkins.com, alignment2012.com, and the 2012story.com uh, will get you much more information. But uh, stay with us. Stable 15 years ago, and it, uh, there's a lot of uh, breakthroughs happening now in uh, academia. Well, that's excellent. I look forward to uh, talking about some of some of this as well. Uh, but I don't know if you've, I mean, I don't think you've directly made any kind of predictions, if you will, when it comes to 2012. But one thing I always like to ask people when, when they return to the program and, and we've been talking about 2012 in, in the past is, have things unfolded so far as you've kind of expected them to, to do, you know, a couple of years ago, or three, four, or might, maybe even five years ago? Have your perception overall of the end date changed as, as we coming closer to it now, uh, John? I've been a bit surprised. Uh, I think 20 years ago when I first got into this investigation, I was uh, a bit naive in thinking that with good research and good documentation that the uh, reconstruction of ancient Maya astronomy would just proceed uh, sort of without a hitch. But I've been somewhat surprised that there's so many uh, politics involved in academia with uh, very strong egos and um, the fact that I'm operating outside of academia as an independent researcher has made the process a bit more difficult than I had imagined. So as far as uh, the whole idea of prophecy with connected with 2012, um, I've been open to languaging that from a, a slightly unusual perspective. I don't believe that prophecy... I'm doing well, Henrik. Uh, thanks for having me on again. Absolutely. I think it's uh, really great to have you back for an update. Uh, 2007, I think, was the last time here we had you on. Quite a bit of uh, time and uh, things have been happening from uh, from that point, obviously. And uh, just to, to give a brief, brief little background here for, for people, I think that most people who are familiar with your work or you're even a little bit about 2012, uh, your, a name, your name is connected to the, the end date of the Mayan calendar, obviously. You've been studying the Mayan culture since about 1985, and uh, you have lots of books, I think nine, if not even more now, uh, you know, under the banner of 2012 and, and the Mayan culture overall. And your latest one here that we're going to talk more about today, obviously, is called The 2012 Story, The Myths, Fallacies, and Truth Behind the Most Intriguing Date in History. Um You've obviously seen the subject of 2012 change, uh, John, and evolve, uh, grown huge, and you know, consequently, many misconceptions have arisen because of that. But where do you think we are now? You know, a, a Hollywood, a Hollywood movie later, so to speak. Where are we right now when it comes to 2012, uh, John? Yeah, the Hollywood movie that came out in late 2009 seemed to be a watershed event in which. Uh, the whole misconception of doomsday projected onto 2012 was uh, um, overdone. And uh, so I think in the collective consciousness, um, people are on one level sort of fed up with the doomsday representation of 2012. It just seems to for 2012 have to do with the prediction of earthquakes or hurricanes or specific sort of Nostradamus-like visions or something like that. Right. I, I think that there's a general understanding that the ancient Maya had about the nature of time and the nature of cycles. The Maya drew their understanding of time from nature. And in nature, time moves in cycles, and you always have a period of increase and a period of decrease. Uh, you know, the moon waxes to fullness, and then it wanes to the new moon, and the year goes through a similar process from summer to winter. And... What I've been able to identify is that in the Maya creation mythology, there is what you might call a prophecy for 2012, but it has to do with the general understanding of cycle dynamics and how these things play themselves out in the realm of collective human consciousness. Mm -hmm. 
And we can get into this a bit later if you want. It, it, it's something that I've written about for many years now. It has to do with the rise of a kind of limited, controlling, uh, self-serving ego consciousness, which eclipses our connection with the transcendent higher wisdom. And so that's one pole, that's one extreme part of the cycle of time that we're in. And then the other is when the ego is put back into right relationship with the higher divine uh, self or, or truth or wisdom. And that's when we have an open relationship with the big picture, the, the whole perspective on what it is to be human. Their astronomical science, which has been sort of the focus of my reconstruction with 2012, but also in their profound spiritual teachings. And I've always seen an integration of these two perspectives, uh, profound uh, spiritual teachings, metaphysics of human consciousness and awakening, as well as a good old-fashioned nuts and bolts reconstruction of ancient Maya cosmology and how it relates to this 2012 date. Uh, so it has been a difficult path, a different, difficult process in terms of making inroads into status quo academia. I'd say that in the last three years there's been a great deal of progress and there are some allies that I have now in, in academia, uh, very progressive uh, scholars, and there's been a great deal of attention to 2012 now because we have the 2012 date on an inscription, a hieroglyphic inscription uh, from the site of Tortuguero, classic period Maya site, which really only came into public, uh, you know, widespread awareness uh, in 2006. So it's a fairly recent thing, and and the inscription has been examined now. And uh, what I've done with this is that there's uh, 13 dates, and there's astronomy related to those 13 dates. So that's exactly where the progress and the revolution is taking place because we're able to identify astronomy in relation to the 2012 date as I always uh, suspected you know mm -hmm. putting my theory on the to be a sensationalized uh, and, and ultimately misleading and and fairly superficial perspective on a very profound topic um, so there's sort of two things going on one is that um, people are sort of fed up with anything related to 2012, so the topic is a bit uh, poisoned, you might say, yeah. um, in the collective, but, um, you know, we're still, we're still, we're still a, year, uh, a year away from the actual 2012 year and uh, over a year and a half from the, the date in December of 2012, so it's my hope that what really should always have been happening, which is an intelligent and honest discussion of what the ancient Maya actually thought about this date can still happen in the collective uh, discussion of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you've been uh, going at it uh, a little bit with some of the academics out there as well. Uh, and some of this, I understand, you cover in your book as well, obviously. Uh, and, 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 you know, credence to you for even having the energy to, to do all that. But ha what's your, what's your um, purpose with that in, in one sense? Do you feel that you've been ab able to actually reach somebody in terms of the work that you've been doing and, and uh, when it comes to studying the Maya, or has it all just been a waste of, of time, John, trying to reach some of these people who have been criticizing you and others who are doing this kind of work? Well, what I've been engaged in is a big project, really, and uh, it's introducing a fairly revolutionary idea into how we understand the ancient Maya, how sophisticated they were in terms of not only